Welcome back. You're watching To The Point. A new book on Narendra Modi was released on Saturday called The Modi Effect. Its author has had hours of access to the Prime Minister. Excerpts from the book have already appeared in the papers and they suggest the book reveals aspects of the Prime Minister that have not been seen or understood before. The author is a former political correspondent with the BBC who's also served as the British Labour Party's Director of Communications. Tonight, Lance Price is my guest to talk about his book and his subject, Narendra Modi. Lance Price, you spent more time with Narendra Modi after he became Prime Minister than any other journalist and probably more time than all other journalists put together. And yet, before he met you, he had no idea who you were, what sort of person you were, and you're also not Indian. How do you explain the incredible access you had? I think that perhaps two things motivated why Narendra Modi wanted to say yes to my request to interviews and presumably no to a lot of other people's. Uh, one was that I understand politics and I understand elections because as you said in your introduction, I worked as a BBC journalist, I've covered uh, general elections all over the world and I've seen them from the inside because I was the Labour Party's Director of Communications uh, during one of Tony Blair's uh, big elections. Um, but also I came in as an outsider, as a foreigner, as you rightly say, and therefore I came without any preconceptions, without any preconceived ideas, either for or against uh, Mr. Modi. And I get the sense, you would know better than me, that uh, in India most people have made up their minds about him. Many people are very strongly in favor of him. Some people are very strongly against him. There aren't very many don't knows. And perhaps the fact that I could come in with a fresh pair of eyes may have been one reason that he thought it was a good idea. So to he saw you as a fresh business. slate and he felt he could write as he wanted and be understood without preconditions and without prejudgments. Yes, I think so. And that I could be uh, impartial and give as balanced account as I possibly could, but the first time that I met him I had to be quite clear with him. I was very grateful for the uh, access that he was giving me and uh, for the exclusive interviews, which of course for a journalist and an author is a fantastic thing to have, but I wanted to make sure that there were no strings attached. And what did and, he say? And he obviously had anticipated the question, he said, no, that's fine, you can write what you like, you can criticise me as much as you want. And once I had that assurance, then I was very happy to go ahead and, and delighted to do so. Before we come to the content of the book, let's start with the man himself. What is Narendra Modi like when you sit in front of him and get him to talk about himself? He's an extremely engaging character, extremely courteous, very polite. Uh, it was a great pleasure to be with him. He's quite captivating, as I think a lot of very successful politicians are. Uh, he makes you feel as if you're the only person who has his attention and uh, the interviews went on for over an hour, some of them. Uh, and during all of that time, he was very much focused on the discussions that we were having. And I've been with other political leaders and you get the sense, even if they're not literally looking at their watch, you sort of think that uh, in their minds they're thinking, OK, what's the next meeting? What have I got to do next? What other things have I got on my mind? With Narendra Modi, I didn't have that sense at all. He was during the focused. time you were with him, you were the only focus of his attention and he wasn't worried about hurrying it up or worried about what came next? No, he, he wasn't worried about hurrying it up and, and we had plenty of time, which was great. And obviously towards the end, his staff would say, we're gonna have to wrap up, Prime Minister, you've got another meeting and that's fair enough, you expect uh, that. I was also a bit concerned before the uh, interview started that perhaps there might be a lot of wasted time with translation and so on. But actually, his English was remarkably good. Uh, all the interviews were conducted in English. Apart all from, the interviews? For a very brief moment during one of them, he, he spoke in Gujarati, but my note taker was able to translate for me very quickly. So uh, that didn't uh, delay things at all. This is fascinating. But he this spoke suggests, very confidently, very confidently in English. This suggests that, in fact, his command of English and his comfort speaking English is much greater than most of us have assumed. I think that's true. Um, and. Do you know, I think that's part of his professionalism as a politician. I think maybe he recognised that if he was going to be, as clearly he now is, the leader of a huge democracy and therefore on the world stage, that a good grasp of English was one of the tools that was necessary. Or maybe he's always had a better English than he's let on. And simply hidden it from the rest of us, that's which sometimes clever politicians also do. Yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of my time in France. There are a lot of French politicians who speak fluent French, uh, fluent, of course they speak fluent French, <laughs> they speak fluent English, but they refuse but to do not. so. You know, you say he dominates the room, his eyes are sharp and penetrating, and you found it hard to look elsewhere. He was talking, is Narendra Modi a little intimidating? 
I'm not sure intimidating is exactly the word. I mean, I'm sure at times he can be intimidating because he's a much, he's a larger than life uh, politician. He's a very, very big figure in all Actually sorts of respects. Actually 56 inches across the chest? I'm not sure it is really 56 <laughs> inches across the chest. Um, uh, I read somewhere else that that's sort of part of him building up his image a little bit, and maybe that's true, but I haven't met his tailor, so I can't tell you uh, for a fact uh, whether, that's, uh, whether that's true or not. But he's a very dominating character, certainly. But uh, actually, in a way, not in an unpleasant way, so when we were conducting the interviews, it was almost as if he was so engaged, looking me straight in the eye when he was talking, that I thought it would have been rude to look away and uh, start... So though he's a minutes. dominant character, he actually puts the other person at ease? He put me very much at ease, yes. Now you say, and this is very interesting, you say he often refers to himself in the third person. He's full of image-building observations of himself, and he's the least convincing when he's trying to be self-effacing. In fact, if I recall correctly, you say he doesn't do self-effacing. Does that mean he tends to brag and boast? Well, he extols his virtues. Uh, we first met only a few weeks, really, after the end of the election campaign. He was still fired up by all of that, and there were state election campaigns still going on. Now, believe me, he wouldn't be the first senior politician to uh, like to talk about himself. They all love to talk about themselves. Of course they do. Uh, that's what you expect, and that's absolutely what I expected. Um, so a, a lot of the conversation was him recalling what he thought were his finest moments during the campaign, the things that went uh, right. Um, and uh, yes, I don't think that he's the most uh, uh, modest and self-effacing person that I've ever met on, on, on this planet. But uh, as I say, I think that's true of most uh, senior politicians. But when leaders. he spoke and he extolled his virtues and he talked about his finer moments during the campaign, did it come across as factual or did it come across as bragging? I'm not sure bragging is exactly the word, but it was certainly, uh, he was very, very proud of it and he would uh, quite frequently uh, remind me of the size of the rallies, uh, of the fact that he hadn't anticipated so many people coming. When I asked him um, uh, of any mistakes that he felt that he'd made uh, during the campaign, um, he said, oh well, there was one rally when he thought only uh, a few thousand people would come and actually many, many, many more people came. So that was the mistake he'd made. <laughs> he'd underestimated uh, his popularity rather than anything else. So he doesn't do admitting mistakes either? Uh, no, I don't think so. But again, um, you know, would, you, would you expect him to? I mean, it's, it's his job to um, uh, put forward his case as effectively as he can and he's very, very good at that. So he's a good self-publicist, if, if that's your question. He's a what, very, very good self-publicist. What happened when you asked him questions he didn't like? If I recall your book correctly, you simply write, he didn't always answer them. But does that mean he was silent or was he evasive or did he simply say, sorry, I refuse to answer? No, he never, in fact, none of those things. He just closed down the conversation very quickly. So, for example, when I asked him about 2002 and the riots and so on, he had a very short answer. You can read the uh, SIT report, the uh, report that was pre prepared for the Supreme Court. You can read the reports. I've got no more to say about that. And it was made pretty clear to me that that was as far as that one was going to go. In fact, I want to quote to you what he said to you when you tried to raise the subject of Godra. Regarding Godra, I have said enough, and you can read the reports in the Supreme Court judgment for yourself. But given that Godra plays and played such a critical role in his political life, and continues to play such an important factor in the way people perceive him. Wasn't this a bit of a handicap for you? Well, I don't think it was because I, it certainly wasn't my job as the author of this book, The Modi Effect, to, to reinvestigate the riots and the causes of them and the aftermath of them. Um, I wouldn't have been qualified to do that. It wasn't what the book was about. I had to uh, talk about that because it's part of what makes Modi who he is. It's part of what's made him a controversial candidate in 2014. So there's a, you know, a good section in the book about uh, what happened in, in Gujarat in 2002, and that's important uh, in explaining him as a candidate, and also, in, of course, in explaining him to, to a readership outside of India. Absolutely, but he wouldn't talk to you about how he handled the shadow of 2002, which loomed over large parts of the campaign, that he was reluctant to do. I didn't press him on it in the way that I would have done had I been writing a book about Gujarat 2002. You felt it would be wrong to press him? Not that I know. No, I, I certainly wouldn't have thought it was, was wrong, but because I thought that so much had already been written about all of that, a lot of which I had read, um, I had formed an analysis of what I was trying to do in the book when it came to the issue of 2002 
was to explain the significance, if any, that that had on him as the candidate for Prime Minister. Uh, and I think he uh, rightly felt that the result on May the 16th, uh, in a sense, drew a line under that, because the people of India uh, knew uh, all about that story. And so this was a finished story? In a sense, it was a finished story. I mean, it will, it will, it will, it will, he'll never be able to shake it off completely. It will always be part of uh, his past. It will always be part of what people uh, say about him and write about him. Unfortunately, Godra wasn't the only issue I gathered from her book that he didn't want to talk about. When you brought up Snoopgate, he didn't want to answer questions on Snoopgate. Was that because he felt vulnerable? I think you'd have to ask him that. Um, he certainly didn't want to expand on, on Snoopgate, and uh, his argument was that it was a flash in the pan. Uh, he also suggested that it was Congress Party dirty tricks. Um, and I uh, looked into the issue, of course, and it did seem to me that uh, although it had the potential to be a very, very difficult story for him, uh, that the BJP, one way or another, handled it uh, quickly and seemed to douse the fires with remarkable speed. Uh, and the fact that they so were So discussing it would have been like rekindling the embers, which he didn't want to do. I don't mind rekindling the embers. But no, he might have. He might have. He might not want to have rekindled the embers, but that's a question you'll have to, you'll have to ask him. Uh, the reason that I didn't uh, do write, write more about it is because it came and it went, strangely. I think... Um, it didn't that, have an impact on the campaign, and so its relevance was limited. Exactly. It didn't seem to have a lasting impact on the campaign, although Congress tried to raise it once or twice uh, subsequently during the But they the got no mileage out they of it. They didn't get much mileage out of it. The other subject that he was very reluctant to talk about is actually, bizarrely, what Hindutva means to him personally. Now, that reluctance I find difficult to understand. Uh, why did he not want to talk about Hindutva? If you look at the election campaign itself, he didn't talk about Hindutva. Uh, he decided, I think quite rightly, if I was advising him, I wasn't, but if I had been advising him, I would have said, keep your mind very much and your eye very much on the ball, uh, and uh, you are fighting this campaign as development man, you're fighting it on twin pillars of development and good governance. Therefore, Hindutva has no role to play. Hindutva doesn't have a role to play, but also politically, strategically, if you think of, it, of the political strategy that he had, those people who I'm sure are a small minority who were going to vote on the basis of ideology and whose ideology was Hindutva were going to vote for him anyway. What he had to do during the campaign was win over the other people. Absolutely. But now the campaign's over and there you are sitting in front of him trying to understand not just the campaign but the man the campaign was about. And Hindutva is a substantial part of his makeup, his character, his thinking, his upbringing. And yet, when you asked him questions about what it meant to him personally, he was reluctant to discuss it. I think the really interesting question is how much that impacts on him now as Prime Minister. And that's an, a, a question that, so far as I can tell, no one has been able to answer. Everyone knows that he grew up through the RSS, that the Hindu for ideology was very important to him. Um, but you don't have to really look at, you don't have to have a crystal ball. You can look at the history. I mean, during the time that he was Chief Minister, he didn't stress it often. No. And he was reluctant to talk about it. He's always reluctant. But to talk during about it. the last 10 months that he's been Prime Minister, and when Gharwapsi campaigns were happening, or Love Jihad campaigns were happening, or when the Christian community felt it was under siege, maybe siege is the wrong word, his silence for a long period until he then eventually spoke out in February was perceived and was interpreted in terms of his personal commitment to Hindutva or the fact that he didn't want to annoy his Hindutva constituency. And therefore, even though it hasn't played an overt part in his prime ministership, people have understood it to be there underneath the surface as the explanation for his silences. Yes, I mean, I suggest in the book I do a, a, a short, relatively short analysis of the period post-election. Uh, um, and the question is, did he not speak out because he didn't want to lose their support? Or did he not speak out because secretly he agreed with them? I don't think we know the answer to that question. In fact, you say very cleverly in that last chapter that like any other politician who's closely associated with the constituency, it's difficult to completely distance yourself because you don't want to lose their loyalty. At the same time, as Prime Minister, you feel a need to move on. And there's a real sense in which Hindut was one of those subjects where he's torn between a constituency whose loyalty he doesn't want to lose and yet the new position he needs to adopt as Prime Minister. I think that's true and I also said in, the, in, in, in that chapter that you refer to that uh, you know, I'm a, 
Western liberal. There's no two ways about it. That's, that's my tradition. That's where I come from. Uh, but where I sometimes part company with other liberals, even in my own country, is that I recognize that uh, a politician who has achieved power has done so on the basis of a coalition of interests. And he has to hold, or she has to hold, that coalition together. Uh, and uh, that politician may not necessarily agree with all elements of the coalition, but it, they need to hold it together. Now, Mr. Modi can't afford to alienate. I suspect he doesn't even want to alienate uh, those for whom Hindu, for whom the ideological aspects related to it are important. Um, but much, much more important to him is delivering on his promises on development and good governance and all the rest of it, because that's where far more people cast their votes. Absolutely. Coming back to your book in the research, you say in your first chapter, I believe, that he gave you several hours. I believe you had some four meetings with him, probably lasting a total of seven or eight hours. And yet there were critical subjects that he didn't want to talk about. Godra is one, uh, Snoop Gates another, Hindutva is the third. So there were actual areas where he'd made pretty clear to you that I will not be forthcoming. Well, there was nothing that I was told that I couldn't ask. Uh, I think that's important. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you spend your whole life doing it in political interviews. The interviewer has the right to ask a question. And the other and person a has point, a right not to answer. The other person has a right to answer in whatever way they, they, they see fit. Um, and, you know, one of the understandings that we had was that this was essentially a book about the campaign. Um, and I considered it fair enough that uh, Godra didn't play a large part in the campaign, and Tutman didn't play a large part in the campaign. Even Stuke didn't. Even Stuke didn't. So there was a, a legitimacy to his reluctance to talk about that. That I was prepared to. I mean, I, I still felt that it was important that I should raise them, but he, you know, he, has, he has a right to. to and you to, to honestly give his mentioned his reluctance to speak about them, and if people have questions to ask, well, those are questions to ask him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, did, I do say in the book that there were times when my eyebrow may have raised a little bit and I wasn't uh, completely convinced by what he was When your eyebrow me. did go up or your skepticism showed, right, what was his response? Because he's a sensitive man who would have realized that you weren't convinced by his reluctance. Did he make some effort to convince you or did he simply accept this is... A a division between us that just will have to stay. Well, let's take an example of that, because one of the times that my eyebrow raised uh, uh, most was when he was talking about, for example, um, uh, the BJP parliamentary board was meeting to decide who should be the, par the pr prime ministerial candidate. And he said, really, I was detached from the whole thing. Uh, I wasn't particularly interested. I didn't mind whether it was me or it was somebody else. I'm paraphrasing, but the exact uh, quotations are, are in the book. And I thought, well, come on. You've wanted this job for a long, long time. You've put a huge amount of time and effort into this. You've prepared for it. Detachment suggests false modesty. Can you re are you really telling me that when the parliamentary board was meeting, you were completely indifferent to what the outcome was? I, I found that hard to uh, I take believe. it another moment which you must have found hard to take and accept was when he said to you that the day the results were coming out, he didn't switch on television or take phone calls till midday by when it was pretty clear that he'd won. In other words, during those critical nail-biting early hours as the results were coming out, he was in another world doing yoga or pretending not to care about the political outcome. And that I did find extraordinary. And again, I, you know, I've been with prime ministers when the results are coming in and they're watching every single seat and they want to know, oh, did we win this one, did we lose that one? So did uh, you believe him when he claimed that he was so detached that he wasn't watching the results? Or did you say to yourself, well, that's what he says, but I'm not going to believe it? Well, it, it's not really for me to believe or to disbelieve. That was his judgment. Although, uh, if we talk about that particular morning on May the 16th, uh, he said to me, I was closed away and my staff were told not to disturb me. And I checked it with his staff, and they said yes, uh, he wasn't to be disturbed until after midday. Um, and then I went through the tweets on the day, and, at, um, and, and he, says, he, he said to me in, in, in terms, uh, the first call I took was from Rajnath Singh uh, after midday to say that uh, we were on, on course for a landslide. I checked the tweets, and actually at 10.26, Rajnath Singh said that he had just spoken to Narendra Modi and told him that they were winning the election. So the tweets disproved what he'd said? Well... Maybe it was such a busy day that he didn't exactly remember the now precise timetable. Now you're a generous man. Now you're well, being I... a generous man, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so what in effect you did was you very cleverly caught the Prime Minister out by comparing what he said with his tweets, but you're going to be generous enough to say maybe on that busy day he got a little confused. Yeah, I mean, politicians build a story about themselves. And, and there biographers are have a right to be generous about their subjects. Well, they have a right to be generous, but they also have a duty to ask questions. And I think it's important that we, that we do that. And, and as you 
very fairly pointed out. I asked a lot of questions, a lot of probing questions, uh, and it's quite clear in the book that I didn't take everything that I was told by the Prime Minister at face value. Let's come to something he says about journalists, and I want to quote. You say, almost invariably, he's predisposed to look for the worst in people, i.e. journalists are almost invariably predisposed to look for the worst in people, and then Modi's, sometimes you say he takes his suspicion too far. To me, that clearly suggests that Mr. Modi doesn't like journalists. Does it actually amount to contempt for them? I don't know whether it amounts for contempt. No, in fact, I, I, I suspect it doesn't amount to contempt. I haven't met a, a, a political leader who doesn't think that journalists are against them, who doesn't think that the media is something that they have to fight with the whole time and that the media is a barrier to them doing their jobs. But they Western politicians use journalists for their purposes and sometimes successfully and sometimes not. Mr. Modi doesn't seem to be too keen to do that, at least now that he's become Prime Minister. He has a different approach to it. And um, I was um, a spin doctor. It was my job to try and get the uh, media in the UK to write nice things about uh, Tony Blair. I was somewhat in awe of his success during the election campaign at getting the media to uh, work to his agenda. He refused to allow the media to set the agenda, and one way he did it was by rationing his appearances. He didn't appear in the studio like this until right at the very end of the election campaign. And he said to journalists, if you want to know what I think, you can come to my rallies, you can read my tweets, you can see what I'm saying on in social media. In other words, as his own spin doctor, he actually was extremely successful. He was extremely successful. He set the agenda day after day after day. Let's come to some of the things he said about himself. Now, not only have astrologers told him that he was likely to be Prime Minister. One day I get the clear impression that he firmly believed for many years that he would be Prime Minister. Does he see himself as a man of destiny? What he said to me was that he believes that his destiny is in the hands of the gods and that therefore he doesn't spend a lot of time worrying about it. And that, he explains, is the reason for the detachment that we were talking about earlier. Whatever when, will be, will be. Whatever will be, will be. So when his fate was being decided by the parliamentary board, or whether his fate was being decided by the electorate, and the, and the, and the results were coming out, he was able to be detached, this is how he explains it, because his fate and his destiny is in the hands of the gods. So why, why worry about and it? And there's a corollary there, isn't there? If you can do that, then great. It, there's it a corollary you... there. He also believes that God's on his side. Well, I think he believes perhaps he's been blessed by uh, the gods and to, to have achieved what, what he's done. Uh, he, even, he even said that uh, his, his, uh, his fashion taste and the fact that he looks good in clothes is a God-given gift. Uh, Quite so right. He actually said to you that he had a great eye for colour and combination. Yeah, a God-given eye. A God-given eye. For colour and combination. There's something he said about the campaign that I found particularly revealing. And this is how you put it. In all corners of the country, they believed Modi was the only hope and wanted to see him win. That's Modi commenting on himself. People have tremendous faith and trust in the individual. Give us a trusted name, not a party name. Does this mean that he believes he won the election, not the BJP? I think that he believes, and because it's clearly true, that he played a huge part in winning the election. But to be fair to him, and I try to be fair to him, even though he's a politician of a different political stripe to, to me, I tried to be fair to him as best uh, that I can. And he did give credit to people in the BJP from the top to the bottom and in the RSS and all the, all the volunteers who came to his colours during the campaign. But without him, the BJP wouldn't have won. Well, the reason I call the book The Modi Effect is I wanted to analyse what was the extra element that Modi brought to it. And if you look at the circumstances of the general election in 2014, they were very fortuitous first circumstances for the BJP. Uh, you had, had two terms of uh, UPA government that had run into the ground, unpopularity, all the corruption scandals that we know about, uh, rising prices, all the other problems that the country was facing. So they were very, very fertile times for a BJP campaign. Now I suspect that if somebody else had led the party, into that general election, probably the BJP, you can't, you can't rewrite history, but probably the BJP would have emerged as the largest party, and whoever that person was but might, not do it, might have do. ended up as Prime Minister. The Modi effect was to take it over that 272 uh, finishing line. So the majority was because of Modi. Other people could have taken the BJP to position number one, 
but Modi alone could have ensured an outright majority in the Lok Sabha. That is his personal victory. That's my hunch. And one of the things that I took away from all my meetings with him was this indomitable will to succeed. I call the last chapter in the book the indomitable will, quoting Mahatma Gandhi. Success comes from the indomitable will. And I don't think Narendra Modi ever considered failure as an option. Maybe he never considers failure as an option. And if you have that energy and drive and determination and self-confidence, then that inspires those around you. And that, I think, probably was the impetus to the size of the majority. Now, you've spent hours with him and you've spoken to him about a wide range of issues. How do you assess his attitude to Muslims and Christians? Is he distrustful or inimical of them? Or is that just a political posture that he puts up as a politician because either it convinces and pleases his natural constituency or because it attracts votes from floaters? I don't have a shred of evidence, certainly not from the discussions that I have with him, that he has any negative views towards uh, Muslims or Christians or any other religious minorities. And what he stressed to me... None of that ever betrayed itself in any conversation? There was no hint of it at all? Not at all. In fact, quite the reverse. So he would talk to me about uh, his record in Gujarat, for example, uh, and the roads that were built, um, and the electricity that was provided, and say, well, nobody ever said that those roads, only Hindus could walk on them, or that the electricity Can I, wasn't as available to Can I put this to you? We talked, or we referred to his silences when love, jihad, and harvapsi and all were going on, and people commented about his silence, and people interpreted his silence in different ways. Then, on the 17th or 18th of February, Mr. Modi spoke out in a very powerful speech to a Christian gathering. Was that in your eyes, as someone who spread hours with him, the genuine Modi speaking out? Or was it the Prime Minister of India sensing that he needed a strategic response to an issue that had become critical not just at home, but even in the eyes of people like President Obama, which was it, genuine or strategic? I think you have to look much deeper into the soul of Narendra Modi than I was able to do to answer that question with absolute certainty. How can we, how can anybody say whether somebody is speaking out of expediency or out of genuine conviction? What I am quite sure about, however, is that Mr. Modi knows that he can only be a successful prime minister of this country if he governs for all Indians. Now, the message that President Obama gave uh, quite clearly was that the outside world was watching uh, and that uh, religious freedom was an absolutely fundamental principle. Uh, and it was only a couple of days after uh, President Obama left that uh, uh, Mr. Modi went to the National Cadet Corps uh, and said that diversity was one of the great strengths of India and that he admired and respected that diversity. If that's the way he conducts himself uh, as Prime Minister, then I think he will be a more successful Prime Minister than if he allows Absolutely. anything else to interfere but with But on that. that critical question, was it genuine or was it strategic, your answer really is you need to know Modi a lot deeper, you need to have introspected into his soul a lot closer before you can answer. In a very real sense, the jury is out on this one. And I think perhaps the jury will always be yeah. out on, on My that last thing. question. He's been Prime Minister for just about 10 months. It'll be 10 on the 26th of March. He's got just over four years left. Do you believe he's going to prove to be a memorable, perhaps even a great Prime Minister, which I think is what he wants to be? Or do you think the expectations are so enormous, he will inevitably prove to be disappointing? I think it's absolutely certain that that's what he wants to be. And so far as I can tell, every task he set himself to, he has been determined to succeed in that. So he will be throwing everything that he's got on being a successful Prime Minister. He didn't go through everything in order to become Prime Minister in order then to throw it away once he was in office. However, the challenges he faces are massive. The expectations he raised during the election campaign were huge, so he set himself a very high bar for success. Um, and in that sense, uh, I'm sure he's already feeling frustration at the pace of change. Uh, when I worked for Tony Blair, he felt that in his first term in office, he didn't act fast enough. And uh, in uh, quite a, a nice quote from Aaron Shuri in the book, he said that Mr. Modi should be acting, he was quoting the Buddha, as if every day, as if his hair was on fire. Five years sounds like a long time, it's not a long time. Uh, it's impossible that he will have met all the expectations raised of him uh, by the end of his five-year term. If he's made enough progress, the people will uh, reward him for that. If he hasn't, they won't. That's politics. All right, Lance Price, let's leave it there. Thank you very much for coming to studio and talking to us both about your book 
and about its subject, Narendra Modi. And there we end this particular episode. If you have been, thanks for watching. Goodbye.